If you ever wonder what the vision of High Point is, bam. I mean, every time that happens, don't you just go, that's what it's about. I mean, that's what it's about. You know, it's just that there's just, there's something compelling about a story. Did you hear him say, when the going public took place and she started telling her story, I began to listen. He hadn't been paying attention to anything else we've been doing all morning long, right? <laughs> but when he heard that story, there's something about someone's story. You got to remember this. Every number has a name. And every name has a story. And every story exists for the glory of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you, thank you, thank you that we are living stories of your love. Living stories of your goodness to us. And God, I pray that today that you will speak to people in such a way that if there's anybody in this room who, do, who does not yet know you, that they would come to know you. And God, for those of us who do know you, that God, we would walk away from here committed to live for you in a greater way. I pray that in Christ's name. All right, let's get a, have a little bit of a review. We're in week four of the Heaven Series. So where have we been? Week one, we began in Genesis because you can't understand the ending until you understand the beginning. And so what we saw was God's original design, the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Delight, the Garden of Desire, this perfect, incredible place. And unfortunately, when man sinned, sin began to destroy man and all of God's creation. But God did not stand by idle. God jumped into the scene and immediately killed a couple of animals, shed the blood, covered Adam and Eve, restored the relationship, and began the plan of redemption to redeem what went wrong. And we were introduced to the principle of continuity that morning. That, that when God created this world in all of his perfection and something went wrong, he didn't go, well, you know, don't worry about it. I'm a creator. I can create something else. No, he said, you know what? There ain't no way I'm going to let the enemy destroy my glory. I'm going to redeem it. I'm going to resurrect it. And I'm going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And that brought us to week two. And week two was all about the resurrection. The non-negotiable promise. Because if there is no resurrection, there is no eternal life. If there is no eternal life, there is no heaven that you have to believe in the resurrection, but not just the resurrection of Jesus. you got to believe that you're going to be resurrected. That yes, you will be resurrected. You will have a physical body and you will serve a resurrected Savior in a resurrected heaven. That brought us to week three. Week three, we talked about what happens when someone dies. Grieving. It's a hard message. But we saw how God didn't create death. And God hates death more than we hate death. And then what God did is he sent his son to die for us so that we might have life. And that's through the grieving that we heal. And through that healing, we begin to have hope. And that brings us today to the promise of God. Today, we are going to talk about what heaven is like. And here's what I want you to see today. I want you to see today the heart of God toward you. Josh has said all morning long, it's the kindness of God that brings forth repentance. 
So instead of us having to be disciplined, instead of us having to be chastised or yelled at or screamed at or make mistakes and have to learn the hard way, today you have an opportunity to learn the easy way. Today you have the opportunity to see the goodness of God toward you, the greatness of God toward you, the glory of God for you. And you have the opportunity for the kindness of God to change your heart and you to say, if someone loves me that much, why would I not just choose him? Why would I not just live for him? And so if you're a guest here today, man, this is an incredible day to be here because you're gonna see the greatness of your God in a unique and special way. So let's jump in, week four, here we are today. Now here's a thought-provoking question. If God were to end history today and reign forever in a distant heaven, now listen to what I said, reign forever in a distant heaven, if history were to end today and he decided to reign forever in a distant heaven, then earth would be remembered as a graveyard of sin and failure. Do you see that? Do you understand that? I mean, what would be our memory of earth if he didn't have a redemption plan for earth? What would be our memory of earth if he didn't plan on resurrecting everything and taking the original design and making it even better? We would look at earth and we'd say, oh, what a tragedy. But let me ask you something. You ever created something? I mean, as a creator, you really care about what you create. And you come kind of protective about what you create because, see, your creation is a reflection of you as the creator. So when God created earth, he didn't just slap it together. He was intentional. He was specific. Because every element of earth was designed to reveal something about himself. You look at the creation of God and you see the glory of God through the creation of God. But yet when man sinned, not only did we begin to feel the ramifications and the ill effects of sin, but it began to affect creation. A rose began to have thorns. Something that's incredibly beautiful had something that could also be painful. But what we see is that when God originally created everything, during the days of creation, what did he say? He, he would create and he'd say, and it was good. And then on the sixth day, he said this, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. So do you know how much God hates graveyards? You ever thought about that? I mean, what in the world does a graveyard and God have in common? Nothing, absolutely nothing. See, God is life, a graveyard is death. God is creator. A graveyard is decay. So did the creator give up on his creation? When we became a fallen people in a fallen world, did he just give up on it? I don't believe so. I think God cared deeply about his creation. I believe God gave us his best. He didn't give us less than his best. And I don't believe God wants the enemy to have any victory whatsoever or anything to kind of brag about whatsoever. I believe creation was God's expression of his goodness and his greatness. See, God's not going to let his creation be remembered as fallen. So what's he going to do? He's going to redeem it. And what does that word mean? It means he's going to buy it back but he buys it back for the purpose of putting it in use again. And when he does that, he's gonna resurrect it. And he will renew the original design. And he'll make it better than ever. So think about this for a moment. God's prophets throughout all the Old Testament and God's people throughout history have always believed that God 
would restore all of this mess back to perfection. They've always believed in a permanent promised land, not just a temporary promised land, not just a king that's gonna reign during his lifetime and kind of have his power and maybe pass it on to the next one for a little time and then it crumble. No, a permanent promised land. They've always believed in a peace and a prosperity that was beyond something that we as people can create. Now, what about the recipients of this promise who died? I mean, have any of these descendants lived to see such a place? Check out Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 through 16. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised. That's a hard statement. I guarantee you every single person in this room believes that there are some things that has been promised to you that you've not received yet. And that creates a lot of misunderstanding at times. And it creates some hurt at times. But I want you to watch this passage. He says, they all died in faith. They didn't die faithless. Even though they didn't receive what they were promised, they still died in faith but having seen them and greeted them from afar. So they kind of got a glimpse of it. They got a sneak peek. And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth, because see, this place is not the place that God designed and created. So when we were banished from the Garden of Eden, it's kind of like we're home, but we're not home. You know, we, we, we know that there's a better place and we kind of long for that place. And yet this kind of place feels like home, but it's not exactly right yet. It says, for people who speak thus, they make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is, a heavenly one. Now this next verse is remarkable. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. What in the world does that mean? See, if God had not delivered on his promises, how do you feel when you don't keep a promise? You feel a little bit embarrassed? You feel like you kind of compromised yourself? You feel like you let someone down? It says God is not ashamed. You know why he's not ashamed that the promise was not fulfilled in their lifetime? Because he has prepared for them a better place. He has prepared for them a homeland, a heavenly one, a city. And the fulfillment of these promises to God's people throughout history requires a resurrection of God's people and God's earth. See, God is not ashamed because earth will not be remembered as a graveyard of sin. He's not ashamed because man and earth will not be remembered as failures. He is not ashamed because he has prepared for them a city. Now watch this. What thrilled these expectant believers throughout all of history was not that God would rule in heaven. He already does that. Their hope was that one day he would rule on earth. They believed in a Messiah that would bring heaven to earth, a Messiah that would bring God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. They longed for God's rule on earth, not just for a hundred years, not just for a thousand years like in the millennium, but forever and ever. See, this is the missing link for the Jews throughout history. The Jews actually have a very accurate picture of the Messiah. Their picture is a reigning Messiah that comes and establishes his kingdom. They just have the order of events out of sequence. He had to come as the suffering servant before he could come as the risen king of glory. See, God's people are not looking for deliverance from the earth but deliverance on earth. So what has God prepared for us? 
We're going to look at Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. And it's my hope and prayer through these verses today that you will see the generosity of God and that you will see the heart of a parent toward you. Someone who looks back and says, you know what, I originally created that Garden of Eden perfect. And yes, my heart was broken when man, when Adam and Eve sinned. But I never gave up on them. They went and hid in the garden, but I went and found them. And I'm never, ever, ever giving up because I sent my son to die for them and to raise again on the third day and to be resurrected so that he could defeat sin and death forever so that I could be with my children again so that I could dwell with them and that I could be their God and they could be my people and here is my gift to you. Salvation is a gift, no doubt, that results in eternal life but the ultimate gift is for everything to be restored. Look at verse 1. He says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Hey, I like things new. You like things new? Do y'all remember I used to talk about that purple Honda that was like a 2000? You know, it was 14 years old. I hated that sucker. I bought a new car, people. It's 2008, but it's new to me. And I love it. I'm so glad not to drive out to that purple Honda. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. We like new because it's like the latest and the greatest. It's the best. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared. Watch this picture. Beautiful picture. Prepared as a bride, adorned. For her husband. This is remarkable. So let's kind of dive into this and walk through this step by step. So this old earth that's fallen, broken, corrupted, will pass away. Just like this broken body will pass away. But it doesn't mean it disappears forever. We will have a new earth just like we will have a new body. And we will have a new heaven. See, in verse 5, he says this. Behold, I am making all things new. Do you believe him? I am making all things new. And see, that takes us back to the principle of continuity. See, there are certain things that he created. He absolutely loved his creation of those things. He is going to redeem those things. He's going to resurrect those things. He's going to renew those things. He is going to make all things new. He's not trashing it. He's simply making it better. Now, some things will be continued and some things will be discontinued. And God will decide what each of those are. But what he's telling us right here through these verses is what will be continued. He says, and I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Now, this is very interesting. Notice that heaven is coming down, not going up. It's kind of a paradigm shift, right? Heaven is not so much a new world up there as it is a new world down here. Now, here's another example of continuity. It's the name of the city. What's the name of the city? The New Jerusalem. Now, two weeks ago, I was in Jerusalem. And I stood on the Mount of Olives. And I overlooked the valley. And I looked at the temple. And on this side of the valley are all the Jewish graves. And on that side of the valley are all the Muslim graves. And we're told in Scripture that Jesus stood there and he looked over the city of Jerusalem and he wept. And he wept for the city. But can you imagine when he's resurrected and when his people are resurrected and he brings a new Jerusalem, no longer will it be a city of tears, it will be a city of joy. It's a holy city. 
See, the city is holy because it's the place where he chooses to dwell. So therefore, his presence defines everything about the city. His light drives out the darkness. His presence drives out the sin. He says, it's a holy city, a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. But here's such a beautiful picture. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now think about this. God is the one who organized the wedding. He's the one that sent out the invitations. And let me tell you something. He sent out invitations to everybody. The good, the bad, the ugly. The worst sinner you can think of and the most self-righteous, arrogant punk you can think of. (laughs) The poor, the rich. Every race, every color. He sent out the invitations. And he came in person as the bridegroom. Then God formed and wooed the bride to love him. Now, as someone who does weddings all the time, there are a couple moments in every wedding that are my favorite moments. And one of those favorite moments is when those chimes ring and everyone stands and everyone turns and faces the bride and she is in all of her glory, all of her splendor, all of her radiance and everyone's looking at her but I'm sitting right here next to the groom and I do this, bam. I look at the groom. Because there's few images as precious and as sweet to watch a groom see his bride walking down the aisle. And that's going to happen one day. And let me tell you something. Unfortunately, tragically, we as the body of Christ, we've kind of been an ugly bride. And we've had kind of a lot of dirt on us. And sometimes we've even been a tramp. But watch this. For Christ so loved the church, the bride, that he gave himself up for her. And he cleansed her through the washing of the water of the word. And he presented her to himself without spot, stain, or wrinkle, but holy and blameless. It doesn't matter how ugly you are as a bride. Once you are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, you are the most radiant, beautiful, glorious thing in all the world. We will be beautiful for God. Salvation occurs when we are loved and cleansed by that love. And then we return that love, and then we give that love. See, heaven is the ultimate expression of being loved and loving. Because in heaven, you are a resurrected person serving a resurrected Savior in a resurrected world with a resurrected people. And we are receiving the love of God, returning the love of God, and loving others with the love of God in a perfect place, in a perfect way. Verse 3, and I heard a loud voice from the throne. I love that, man. I love God is like, I mean, he is a bad dude, you know? Loud voice. I mean, he is, a, he's on a throne. He is authoritative. He is powerful. He is not a wimp. Stop giving me this wimpy version of Jesus. I mean, he is king of kings, dude. He is a kick, you know what kind of guy. Hey, dude, with a loud voice from the throne, you know what I said? Behold. Stop, focus, give me your attention. The dwelling place of God is with man. I mean, do you just, wow. The creator wants to be with his creation. Guess what? The father wants to be with his son. The mother wants to be with her daughter. It's the most natural thing in the world. God has prodigal children too, and he's pacing like crazy, waiting for them to come home. 
with a loud voice from the throne. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their Lord. This is literally, truly one of the greatest statements in all the Bible. One of the most triumphant statements in all the Bible. It is why God created us. It's why he created the covenant with Abraham. It's why we have a new covenant in the brokenness of his body and in his blood. Leviticus 26, 11 and 12, kind of a strange book. We don't read it very often. Watch this, something remarkable. He says, I will make my dwelling among you. But notice this. He says, and my soul shall not abhor you. What's that all about? Through sin, we became ugly. Through sin, we became sinful. Through sin, we have done the most heinous, horrific, terrible things to the children of God. And he would have every reason to abhor us. But he says, no, what I am going to do is I'm going to take you from death to life. I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to free you. God has always been searching for a people to reveal himself. And his revelation demands a response. Did you hear me? You are not just coming to church this morning because it's just your routine. It's just something you ought to do or should do. Revelation of God demands a response. God is speaking, and when he is speaking, you respond. You don't treat it casual or flippant. Does anything make you more mad as a parent when you say, you know, I'll just use, you know, my children's name or one of my children's name because it's the most frequent one I use in this way. Hey, Mark. <laughs> Nothing. Mark. Nothing. And you know what drives me nuts? It's got those beats on upstairs. You know, if it wasn't hard to, Mark! And still, nothing. By that time, I mean, I'm just I'm going to kill him. I'm going to rip those beats. Because, you know, I mean, just, I just want you to be able to hear me. I just want you to respond. When dad says something, respond. When mom says something, respond. Is God ever that way? Hey, I, I, I kind of whispered it to you the other day. And then I spoke a little bit louder. And sometimes Mark would go, what? are you yelling because I have said it calmly four or five times now and I'm just going crazy right now because this is the sixth time and sometimes I feel like God's that way like we're like why are you yelling because you haven't been listening he says he's going to dwell with us the word dwelling means tent it's a, it's a a rich Old Testament word that kind of is the tent of meeting or the tabernacle. Watch it. It's where the sacrifices were offered. It's where God would meet with Moses. It's where Moses would intercede and pray for the people of God. It's where Moses saw the unveiled glory of God. And that word dwell is so significant in the New Testament. John chapter 1 verse 14 says this, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we have seen his glory glory as the only son from the father full of grace and truth full of grace and truth so here's what revelation tells us about heaven verse three and i heard a loud voice from the throne saying behold the dwelling place of god is with man now here's what that means the perfect god will dwell with the perfected man the essence of heaven is the un veiled presence of God. When Moses saw the glory of God, he had to put a veil over his face because he did not want the others to see the glory of God in a diminishing way. But when we are in heaven, there is no veil. We see his glory. We receive his glory. We reflect his glory. And everything is glorious. But you got to understand this. There is no peace without his presence, both right now on earth and in heaven. And there is no prosperity without his presence. And there is no permanency without his presence. And watch verse 4. If it isn't good enough yet, watch verse 4. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Every tear. Every tear. 
and death shall be no more. How, can you imagine the look on Jesus' face when he wipes the tear from your eye? Man, oh, can you imagine the satisfaction? Yes, for the joy that was set before him, I endured the cross so that I could wipe that tear. Yes, for the joy that was set before me, I endured the cross so I can wipe that tear. Lazarus, come forth, unbind him and let him go. Mary and Martha, come rip the grave clothes off him, embrace your brother. I'm gonna wipe that tear off your face. No more mourning, no more death, no more crying, no more pain. If you as a parent could give your children anything, this is what you would give them. No more death, mourning, crying, pain, tears. Whatever you do, do not miss the most tender image in all of the Bible. This is the very best and most precious picture of our heavenly father there is. This is also the best, most tender picture of the husband. Husbands, love your wives as Christ so loved the church and gave himself up for her, cleansing her by the washing of the water of the word, presenting her to himself without spot, stain, or wrinkle, but holy and blameless. See, heaven isn't just about the absence of problems. It's about the fullness of life. He also says, I came to give you life and life more abundant. But do you realize we must be insane not to choose this? Because that verse, John 10, 10 says this. It begins this way. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But I've come to give you life and life more abundant. Oh, let me see. Which one do I want? Are you kidding me? It means, I mean, it shows you how deceived we are, how blind we are. Choose life for you and your descendants. This day I've set before you life and death, the blessing and the curse. I am begging you, choose life. He says, I've come to give you joy and to make your joy full. Do you see the heart of God and how that's expressed through heaven? Verse 5, he says, and he who was seated on the throne, again, He's a bad dude. I mean, dude is on his throne, complete control. You got to get, you got to understand that. Behold, I am making all things new. But after all that, this is perhaps my favorite. And he said, hey, you know these things I just told you? Write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. Bam! Bam! I mean, I mean that like, dude, I mean, you know, it's, it's Super Bowl. I mean, we're just spiking it. Bam! I mean, if I, if I could dance, I'd do a Super Bowl dance right there. I mean, this is trustworthy and true. Bam! I mean, a white man had to invent that little spin the football. Boom! Because he can't dance. You know, he just let the football dance for him. <laughs> Bam! That's what I would do. Write this down. These words are trustworthy and true. I've got confidence. You know why I've got confidence? Because I've got confidence in his character. He's a promise keeper. I've got confidence in his competency. But, but let's be real. Let's not be super spiritual. I mean, don't you have a little bit of doubt? It's been like 2,000 years, dude. Why ain't you come back yet? Right? Don't you have a little bit of doubt? But watch this. Verse 21, chapter 21, verse 6. And he said to me, it is done. You got any doubt? It is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. It is done. Not it will be done. It is done. It is accomplished. And he continues. He says, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life. Watch without payment. It's not going to cost you anything. Here's the only thing you need. A sense of need is the only requirement. You know what you got to be able to do? You got to say, I'm a sinner. 
I can't save me. I need a Savior. And only Jesus meets that need. And only Jesus satisfies that thirst. And only Jesus conquers. See, it says, the one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. I want to end on this. Watch this. Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. It says, and they conquered him by the blood of the lamb. But there's part two, watch. And by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. So salvation is by the blood of the lamb. But what is the significance of this? Tank. Baptism is by the word of their testimony. It says, we've conquered him, the enemy, the enemy, by the blood of the lamb and by the word of the testimony. There's many of you, you've trusted Christ, you've raised your hand recently, and for some reason you're scared of this thing. Listen, this is a celebration. You want to have victory over the enemy on an ongoing, continued way. You want to conquer. It's by the blood of the lamb and by the word of your testimony. you got to go public. Why in the world would you be scared of this? But this is that victory. Bam! That touchdown dance. That spiking the ball. It's that I'm kicking your tail. That's what it is. And so today, you have an invitation to choose heaven or accidentally, unintentionally, by waiting, doing nothing, choosing hell. And he says, the thief came to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and life more abundant. I am begging you today, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. I am begging you today, Give your life to Jesus Christ. I am begging you today, go public. Overcome and conquer the enemy. Let's pray together. This is the most important part of the service. Please, I beg you right now to give attention to my words. If you are uncertain at all about where you would spend eternity, about whether or not Jesus Christ has changed your life, you can pray this prayer. Dear God, please forgive me my sins. That means I've missed the mark. It means I'm not perfect. God, forgive me. Then you say, God, I repent of my sin. Why? Because of the kindness of God. I repent. I change my mind. I don't want to keep living that old way. I want to live for you. God, I'm asking you to do this one thing. Save me. And the scripture says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just say, save me. And in that moment, as soon as you say, save me, here's what God does. He immediately forgives you. And then he gives you the Holy Spirit to begin to live in you and through you so that you can begin to be freed from sin today and tomorrow and every day. And what should immediately happen in your heart once you pray that prayer, save me, is something should well up inside of you that says, thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for saving me.